about to get ready to go in the Word. And we're going to finish up today on the table of showbread. There's always been a misunderstanding of the table of showbread, what it is and what it isn't. And we're going to finish today of what the table of showbread really is. It may surprise you, but I always start with some word because there's no sermon that's not, that's worth anything that's not based in the word. It has to be based in the word of God. Right. Philosophies and, and what I think and what smart men think are ridiculous. What matters are the ancient words. And I, I'm, I'm going to go to a, a real ancient word here written by Moses. And he's writing, he wrote the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch. And Abraham had, when he had left the land of Ur, God told him, I want you to pick up and leave all your family. And Abraham made a mistake. He took his nephew with him, Lot. And when God calls you, it's always better to not take a lot of stuff. Don't bring a lot with you. And Lot had been captured, and Abraham had to go rescue him. And God blesses that process, and Abraham had his own foot soldiers. The Bible says over 300 of them. And, and he comes back, and, and he comes back to a little place called Salem. You know it as Jerusalem. And there happens to be a priest in Salem, and his name is Melchizedek, and he is the king of Salem. And as Abraham returns, the king of Salem, Mel Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Everybody say bread and wine. Bread and wine. I'm, re I'm reading Genesis 14 here to you, Genesis 14, 18. And he brought out bread and wine, and he was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him, Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And he blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And so here he clearly says it is God that gave Abraham the victory. It is God that has given us the victory today. Over death, hell, and the grave. It is God who has given us the victory. But I want you to go back to that first verse, if you will. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And we've read that for years and years and years and just read on past that. Now, I'm going to explain that today. Okay, we got some other reading I want to get to of ancient words. 1 Corinthians 11, 23, 26. And the apostle Paul writes, as he'd been taken up in the glory, and he had never met the Lord Jesus Christ in person, but he met him in the Spirit. And he says, I received from the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, when the King James, go back there, that word proclaim is said show in the King James Version. It says show. But they misspelled it. It's spelled S-H-E-W. Can you believe that? So this word in the King James is shoe. S-H-E-W. Okay? So proclaim that. That's, that's the other versions of it. So guys, do we have any, any other reading for today? All right. So it, Paul says in Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11, that it does show forth the Lord's death until he comes. So as often as we drink this bread and drink this cup, you do show, S-H-E-W, the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we pray your blessing upon the word today. We ask for your anointing of grace and peace. We ask for your anointing of understanding that the word of God would become the engrafted word in Jesus. Just as you became flesh, the word of your word can become flesh in our lives. And so I ask that this word would just be flesh and manifested in the hearts and lives of those today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. If you agree, say amen. Amen. In 1 Samuel 21, verse 6, there's a very interesting story that David and his men, they're running from uh, King Saul, and they've been running from Saul for quite a while at this point. Of the 21 times that Saul tried to kill David, I believe this is about the 18th time he tried to kill David. And David and his men were without food. They were without bread. And they were starving. And David goes to the priest, and he says, hey, can we have... Bread, And he says, we don't have any bread other than the bread that comes from the table of showbread. And he said, I've just replaced it today with, with new bread. And he said, it is not lawful for you to take it, lawful for you to take it. And he says, well, he said, my men are starving to death. And the priest asked him something. He says, uh, 
I'm not going to get into what he actually, actually asked him physically, but he says, hey, he says, are you worthy of the bread? You, remember, you know when we take communion, the apostle Paul says, do not take this unworthily. Do you know, you know Paul asks us to do that when we take communion? He said, don't take this unworthily. And so the priest asked David, he said, are you and your men worthy? And he said, yes, we are. And so the priest gave him that bread. Now Jesus later talks about that, and he talks about the power of the Sabbath, and that Sabbath is made unto man. And what was amazing is God didn't strike him dead. God didn't curse him. Jesus alluded to it. And actually, Jesus put his blessing on it in the New Testament. In fact, in Psalms 23, 5, David says this. He said, Thou preparedest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. In the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, and my cup runneth over. Now, in Genesis, I, we have just read that Melchizedek had brought out bread and wine. Bread and wine. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, 26, Paul reminds us, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show, S-H-E-W, the Lord's death until he come. And that's how it is in the King James. So, everybody here understands, I'm sure, that the blood of Jesus washes away your sin. How many understand that? By, you understand is washed away your sin. But it doesn't wash away your propensities. <laughs> the washing of the water with the Word does that, and that comes through the sanctification process. So, guys, do we have the... The Tabernacle of Moses. I love to teach here because I can explain Jesus Christ from the Tabernacle of Moses better than any place in the Bible. And here we have the brazen altar, and this is where the lambs were slain. The brazen altar represents the cross. But what was interesting, after the priest sacrificed the animals there, they had a process where they had to go to the brazen laver. And this was made of brass, and this is made out of brass. And last Sunday, I told you that as they looked into the labor, they could see a reflection of themselves. In that reflection, that's where the Apostle Paul says, in, in a mirror, we see darkly. In other words, God is saying, as you look in that, you'll see who you really are. Have you ever come to understanding that as you look at your life, you begin to understand who you are? And that you need a little help and you need some things fixed up in life. How many have ever realized, I need to grow in Christ? I had one person tell me, oh, God loves me just the way I am. And I told him, yeah, but he loves you too much to leave you the way you are. <laughs> so the blood of Jesus, it washes us clean from our sins. But just as I told you last week, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they had some of Egypt that came out with them, didn't it? They ended up dancing around a golden calf. I've seen Christians go to the altar and live at the altar for years and years and years. And never leave the outer court. And the outer court was available to any and all who came. Jew, Gentile, mixed multitudes. God said, you can come into the outer court and have salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can absolutely come to the cross. And that represents the cross. You can come in and read the Bible and have the washing of the water with the word. And, and that's where we begin to have justification here. But sanctification happens. And what did Joshua tell the children of Israel? Sanctify yourselves, Joshua said. Many people are waiting for God to sanctify them, but sanctif sanctification is something you choose to do. You choose to put away the things in your life that God says. You choose to read the Bible. You choose to pray. You choose to church. Sanctification is a process you choose. I've had people tell me, I'm waiting God for sanctifying me. I said, well, you're going to wait a long time. God tells us to do it. Say, sanctify yourselves. That's the Word of God. That's clearly the Word of God. So here... <coughs> We have the cross and we have salvation. Here we have sanctification. And that represents the washing of the water with the word. And I explained that to you last week. The, you know, the Bible talks about in Paul that as we read the Bible, it begins to wash us clean of all the things in our lives that God wants to pick up and clean up in our lives. The propensities that we had that we came out of the world. And here's where the priest would put on after they cleansed himself, the robe of righteousness. But, you know, God's design was very in, in, intimate in relation. I said, I don't just want to have an outer court relationship with you. I want to have an inner court relationship. I want intimacy. Yes. God says, I, I want to be intimate with you. Yes. Right. He said, I died to have a relationship with you that's intimate. The reality is on the outside, we see how we are. We see how you are. But in the inside, we see who God has made us to be. 
Paul puts it this way, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my understanding. Let me see. Let me see how I really am. So outside, I, I see who you are, but inside, you see who God has made you to be. And what I love about the inside is you not only see who God made you to be, you see who God is to you. You see God as your Father. So on the outside, everything's made of bronze, but when we go on the inside, everything on the inside in the holy place in the holy of holies is made of gold. So outside, everything's bronze, but you go inside the tent, everything's made of gold, so we're moving from bronze to gold. The writer of the Hebrews puts us this way, a better covenant. A better covenant. So we're moving from bronze to gold, Old Testament to New Testament, a better covenant. Gold is more pure and valuable than bronze for sure. So when we go in, we're going into better things. The book of Hebrews is known as the book of better things. There's 11 things in there that Paul says are better things. The Apostle Paul also talks about going from glory to glory in Christ. The reality is gold will never be anything but gold. You can refine gold, you can melt gold. The only thing that happens is the draught is passed off and the pure gold remains. So the fire will take the impurities, but it will not take the gold. And it's the same as people. The Lord says in the scripture, the Lord knows the way that I take, and when he has tried me, I shall come forth as pure gold, scripture says. Hebrews says that there's so many better things, and one of the things that Christ has done for us is give us a better covenant and a better priesthood in Jesus Christ. I praise God for the priesthood of Jesus Christ. And I don't have to bring a lamb once a year. I don't have to bring turtle doves and pigeons anymore. Jesus Christ has gone in once and for all, and the sacrifice has been made. Can you imagine showing up to church with your lamb in the back of your truck on Day of Atonement? So Hebrews tells us Jesus has made us a better covenant. And so as we enter the holy place, the first thing the priest would do would light the lampstand. And the lampstand represents the person of the Holy Spirit. And the lampstand is what now gives inner illumination. Before as you go over here and the veil is closed, you are now under the covering of God. His covering himself. I'm feasting at his banqueting table and his banner over me or his covering over me is love. So God says, when you come here, it's love, it's love, it's love. Amen. Oh, I, I wish you'd get that in your spirit of knowing how much God loves you. And as they would light the, light the, the, light the menorah, the, the, the lampstand, it would give light now onto the table of showbread and onto the altar of incense. So let's find out what the table of showbread is. The table of showbread, which is actually in Hebrew. So guys, could we bring up, this is, this is a, let's turn the lights down so they can see it. This is a rendering of the table of showbread out, out, out of the Old Testament. And it's spelled, it's spelled S H E W, showbread. The bread is called the bread of presence. And before I, I get to this, I, have to, I got to make the table. So we got the bread on the table, but let's talk a little bit about the table. So this is the ordinary table in relation to what we look at. It's made out of acacia wood, which acacia wood is very strong, it's tough. It's actually very resistant to water, but it can be cut, it can be bruised, and it can even bleed. Have you ever scraped a tree or a pine tree, especially in your house or in your yard, and just watched the pine tree? It will bleed. And so the original framework work is made out of acacia wood, but it is covered in solid gold. And the crafters of Israel would do that as after they made that according to God's specification. Everything was overlaid with gold. So the wood which is cut is perishable. It can be cut, it can be bruised, it can bleed actually. But it's made with gold that is imperishable. And it's a representation of Christ himself. God and man. Think about that. Divinity and humanity wrapped in one. So the wood represents the humanity of Christ, and the gold represents his divinity. The reality is it had to be made by God's specification. It had to be able to be moved. And you'll see the staves that the children of Israel had to make. Let's see. The table of showbread, which represents Jesus Christ, had to be able to be moved. I read a scripture one time where, And the word became flesh. 
and dwelt amongst us. So the word which was in heaven became flesh and moved to earth. And because we couldn't go to God, God said, I'll come down to you. He said, because you can't come up, I'll come down. Hallelujah. The table had to be able to move. Jesus, well, you know, Jesus moved his ministry all over the nation of Israel. And the Bible says that he dwelt among us and we beheld the wonder of his glory. So one table, two elements. One man, the man, Jesus Christ. But he's also the God man. And he felt not, it not robbery to be equal with God. So the table represents our Lord. I praise God that he took on that representation. He couldn't redeem us if he hadn't been, become wood. If he hadn't become flesh. See, the wood made him kin to you and I. And my kinsman redeemer comes from something that can be cut. Can be bruised. Can hurt. Can bleed. Scripture says that he became man so that he could be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Aren't you glad that when you pray, your prayer life is effective because you have a high priest that can be touched by the feelings of your infirmities? How horrible it would be to pray to a God or a little Buddha statue and he don't know how your heart hurts. He don't know how your arm hurts. He don't know that you're sick. He doesn't know that you have a headache. Go, don't tell me. I praise God for the glory of having a high priest that can be touched by the way I feel. Hallelujah. It would have messed up my prayer life if I had a priest that I had to pray to and he didn't know how I felt. But I praise God. Scripture tells me he knows exactly how I feel. Right. To be tired and weak and hungry. Do you know God had never been tired? He had never been hungry. He'd never been sick. He'd never been weak. So when Jesus took on the form of a servant, God all of a sudden felt the pain of hunger and the pain of resentment, the pain of rejection. And that's why our redemption is so peculiar in relation to how we are redeemed. We are redeemed by a God who became man and he can feel your hurt and your pain. He can feel what it feels like to be human. He can feel what it feels like to be sick and to be hungry and be tired. I don't know about you, but sometimes tired is worse than anything. It seems as you get older, sleep is something that evades you. I've done enough study to find out it's a multi-billion dollar industry in America and the world. It's interesting that the older you get, you covet a good night's sleep. My goodness. Jesus knew what it was like to be tired. Man, a God that understands me. What a wonderful thing. The reality is Christ is the table of showbread. Oh, you know, oh my goodness. You know what? Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Your scripture tells you Jesus was born in Bethlehem. You know, Bethlehem means house of bread. That's what it means. Jesus was born in the house of bread. In fact, Jesus in all his ministry said, I am the bread of life and he who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And according to the law, the bread was never to leave the table. There was always supposed to be bread on the table. I'm telling you, God always has provision in his house. I'm telling you, God always has provision in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ always has bread for you. you I will not leave you or forsake you. Uh, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. There is bread at the master's table, and Jesus Christ is the bread himself, and you will always have provision in Christ. The, the table never was to be without bread. Always provision in Jesus Christ. And the reality is, it's not that God is giving us new ideas in the New Testament. It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ from the old. So this thing about bread is not new. Any, anybody ever remember a story of God sending manna to the children of Israel? And it would rain down manna during the night. It would fall, the Bible says it would fall on the dew. And they would wake up, open their tent, and there was bread. Manna, the food of angels, David tells us. And God said, you need to get up out of your tent and go get your bread. And you had to gather bread. And God said, I'll provide for you even when you're sleeping. I'll provide for you. Even when you're at night asleep, God says, I'll provide for you. Amen. He is your provision. So Jesus Christ saying that he's the bread of life is nothing new. Jesus said, I am that bread that came out, the true bread. So even though we speak like this, we're convinced that there are better things in Christ. I don't know about you, but 
What the children of Israel ate, the, the bread they ate, the Bible says that they got hungry again. But Jesus said, you eat of my bread, you'll never hunger again. You, you eat of this true bread of heaven, you'll never hunger again. You'll never start going, wanting to go back to your old life. You'll never get hungry for the things that got you in trouble before you came to God in the first place. One of the things that in my life as my mother and father got saved, one of the things is they left the old way of life and they never went back. See, one of the, one of the things that, that God was upset with the children of Israel, he had provided bread, the bread of heaven, and yet they wanted the garlic and the leeks of onions of Egypt. They wanted to go back to their old life. God has set me free from the old life. So here we have a pitcher of bread, a table with bread on it. And there's 12, 12 loaves there, obviously, the 12 tribes of Israel. But hold it. You know, so hold it. That guy got it wrong. That, that, that's not really what the table of showbread looks like. That, that, that's a religious rendition. Uh, do, guys, do we have the spiritual rendition of the table of showbread? Ah, there's the table of showbread. That's in your Bible, Numbers. See, religion teach you that on the table was only bread. But if I look at that long enough, I see, I see a communion table. I see communion table right there. Hold it. Get your, you get your Bibles and you read Numbers and you'll find out what was on the table of showbread. It wasn't just bread. It was bread and the drink offering required by God that had to be on that table also. Ooh, hallelujah. You learned something today. It wasn't just bread. All my life in religion, I thought he just had bread on it. But no, that, well, that, uh, let's see. Melchizedek, he brought out what? Bread and, he brought out what? This was wine. You mean all that time, those children of Israel, when the priests were in the holy place there with God, they were having communion all that time? They weren't just in there buttering up their bread, sliding up a peanut butter and eating some bread. They were in communion service with God. They were having communion. Jesus is not an afterthought that after Adam sinned, God said, what am I going to do? Jesus has always been God's plan for redemption from the day one, the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. Jesus has always been God's plan for redemption. The communion of the Lord Jesus Christ started with Melchizedek. The communion table started with Melchizedek. In the Old Testament, we, don't, we have never thought that there was communion. In, but I'm going to tell you right. In the priest on, 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 on the Sabbath, they would come in and they would change the bread out. And they would have to offer new bread to God. And they would have to offer the cup. Yeah, oh yeah, it's, it's in Numbers. You can read it. You know, most people don't read the Old Testament. I praise God for the Old Testament. It, it defines who Jesus Christ is. So they had bread and wine in the holy place. They had communion with God. I thought they were just in there eating peanut butter sandwiches. <laughs> Bible says in Matthew, Jesus took bread, he blessed it, broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. This is my body, which is broken. And they would take the bread and they would break it. This is my body. This is my body. And they would take it and they would break it. And Jesus said, he broke the bread. Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink from it all. For this blood is the blood of my new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission or, or removal of sins. Hallelujah. Remission is a New Testament word. It's not an Old Testament word. Yes. So, brothers and sisters, the Last Supper was really a communion service. Yes. Jesus kind of changed it up on the apostles. He told them we're going to go celebrate Passover. So I can just imagine Peter, James, and John, hey, we're Passover, we've been there, we're going to talk about Moses, we're going to talk about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, we're going, to, we're going to have, you know, eat eat the bread, we're going to do all this, and Jesus says, hold it, I'm the Passover lamb. I, I, I'm the Passover lamb. My body is the broken body, I, my body is the lamb that is going to be slain. My blood is going to be the drink offering unto God. I, I can imagine the confusion at the table. I'm sure it started with Peter. What, what's he talking about? 
Jesus changed Passover up. He changed Passover to communion. They had been celebrating it for thousands of years and didn't even understand that they were celebrating what Jesus Christ was about to do on the cross. That's right. This was the drink offering unto the Lord. That was the bread offering unto the Lord. So now you understand back in Genesis, God's been having communion ever since Genesis chapter 14. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, king of Jerusalem. Who is the king of Jerusalem according to your Bible? David. Jesus Christ himself is the king of Jerusalem. So Melchizedek, who I believe is a theophonic or a theophoric representation of Jesus Christ, he brings out the bread and wine of the Most High God. And he tells Abraham, we're going to do something that you won't even understand what it is, but one day your descendant, great, 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 he said, we're going to have a little thing called communion. It's going to represent the redemption of mankind. Even Abraham got to have communion with God. My goodness. We're about to celebrate what God has been putting in process for eternity. Jesus said to them in John, I tell you, Moses, he didn't give you true bread. He said, I am that true bread that came from heaven. They ate and hungered again. But he said, you eat this bread you will never be hungry again, for I am the true bread of heaven. Melchizedek is represented in Hebrews 7 is without father, without mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or ending of days. It sounds to me like the Son of God to me. Yes. He remains a priest forever. No record of genealogy, no ancestral line, no record of his birth, no record of his death. <laughs> My goodness. The reality is, Hebrews tells us that the Mosaic Law was insufficient to save us. It covered sin, but it did not remit sin. Hebrews tells us we had a priesthood in the Old Testament, was a priesthood of man, but the New Testament priesthood is a priesthood of God. And it not only saves us, it not only covers our sin, but oh, brothers and sisters, this is what is so wonderful. It removes your sin. So now let me explain that to you. In law, when you have a charge against you, and you have been found guilty, you have a record. But sometimes things happen, and you can go to the court, and because of new evidence, or the, the way things are presented in court, you can have your record expunged, wiped away, and you get all your rights back. You get all your rights back. I'm going to say it to you. Get it. Yes. You're going to get it. See, Jesus expunged your charges. Hallelujah. They're now removed. Yes. And you have all your rights back. All the promises of God are yea and amen to those that believe. Everything God promised Adam and Eve. Everything God promised Abraham. They are yea and amen according to his holy word in the New Testament. You have your rights back. Hallelujah. Yes. You've been. You have been set free. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Say, my charges have been expunged. My charges are gone. So now the enemy has nothing to accuse you of. My goodness. What are you going to accuse me of? Righteousness? Is that what you want to do, enemy? So in the place of fellowship here with God in the holy place that we looked at now that we have the lamp, the table of showbread before us in the holy place. The table we see, it's laden with bread. It's a place of provision, a place of communion, a place where the priest of God would meet and have communion, the literal communion service, every Sabbath. And Israel did not even understand completely and totally what they were doing, the representation of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he was going to become the bread and the wine for humanity. On the inside, you no know, longer had the bright glare of the outer court of the temple of Moses from the sun. Now on the inside, you had the room of the golden lampstand, the only source of light, which is from the light of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And it had seven lampstands on it, which represents the seven spirits of God. We had the altar of incense that was in there. And what the lampstand says is, as you come into a relationship with and realization of who Jesus Christ is, it is the Holy Ghost that will illuminate who Jesus Christ is. Yes. As you go to the altar incense and pray, it is the Holy Spirit that will help you pray and intercede before God. 
And that's the light of the, of the golden, golden lampstand before God. It was to illuminate the table of showbread and the altar. The Bible tells us that the bread was made from fine flour. Fine flour that, it wasn't just flour, it was fine flour. Everybody say fine flour. Fine. Flour that had been crushed and beaten. And ground to a pulp. To become pure bread. It foreshadows Jesus' suffering, his death. It establishes Jesus' suffering at the cross, at the whipping post. And his shame at his trial. The reality is, in the Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson got it about as right as it could be given, without it getting to a point where you couldn't even watch it. Jesus said, I am that living bread. Jesus said, I am the showbread. I am the showbread of heaven. I am the showbread. The drink offering, there were bowls and cups and pitchers on the table of showbread. They were also made of pure gold. See, with the showbread, the priests were commanded an, a drink offering unto the Lord. It was wine from golden cups and pitchers. And this is a picture of Jesus' shed blood and his broken body. So we look at this. So we see the priest breaking bread, eating bread, pouring out a wine offering to God himself. In unity as a witness of the coming Messiah. And what he was going to do for mankind, the life he was going to give. See, most people that I talk to, they, they just think there's bread on there. That's what they think. But if you read your Bible, you find out there was a drink offering. And it was communion all the time. Say with me, God's been having communion? God's been having communion. From Melchizedek on. God said, I'm going to celebrate this. Of what my son is going to do from time and all eternity. So we see the, bread, the priests of Israel breaking bread and offering a drink offering to the Lord. In unity as a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ and his efficacious work at Calvary. And he told his disciples that as he gave thanks and broke it, this is my body broken for you. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood that I'm shedding for you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. So we read it earlier where the Apostle Paul tells us in Corinthians. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth. The table of show bread means to show forth. That's what the word here means in Hebrew, show, S-H-E-W. You are to show forth. The table of show bread was to show forth. A coming Messiah and his redemptive work in the earth. So now the Apostle Paul, who understands this very well, he writes here, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show, S-H-E-W. Awesome. Awesome. Because he's talking about the table of shoe bread. And this is the table of shoe bread in our new covenant. It's the same as this. This is the table of shoe bread. And Paul says this. Listen to this. This is what the Apostle Paul is saying. Do this. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the Lord's death till he comes. And once again, we see the word show, S-H-E-W, forth. And Paul is saying, this is that. And that is this. And God has been celebrating it on the earth ever since the time of Melchizedek. And we are to celebrate it often according to the word. And just like they, the priest asked David, he said, are you men worthy? The apostle Paul asked us, before you do this, check yourself. Make sure you're worthy before God before you do this. So we always take a minute to examine himself. This is exactly what the priest was asking David. Examine yourself. You can read the story and find out what he really asked him. So Paul saying this shows forth, just as this did was the table of shoe bread. This is the shoe bread table of the New Testament. I love that the New Testament, it doesn't ever conflict with the, with the Old Testament. Do you know that? That's right. That's right. That's right. In fact, if you take the Old Testament out of the New Testament, you lose one third of the New Testament. 
And all the Old Testament does is say Jesus is coming, and the New Testament just a revelation of He's here. This is that. Hallelujah. God's been celebrating this forever. God been saying, I have a remedy for the problem of Garden of Eden. I have a remedy for your insanity. I have a remedy for your stupidity. I have a remedy, hallelujah, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil? And the devil said to him, and the devil just heard the father announce, when they, remember when Jesus was baptized? The Bible says that when he came up out of the water that the heavens opened and, and a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The devil never listened to God's word. So in the temptation, the Bible says immediately, Jesus, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness in the temptation. And the devil says, if you be the Son of God, if thou be the Son of God, he just heard his father say that he was. The devil can never quote scripture, right? Because he's a liar. When he went to Eve, he said, did God say? He'd been confused from day one when he got kicked out. I believe that God kicked him so hard in the head it affected him, apparently. <laughs> But he asked Jesus this, if thou be the Son of God, turn this stone to bread. Why would Jesus turn stone to bread when Jesus is bread? Why would Jesus turn something into something he already is? you got to know who Jesus is. He is the bread of life. He is your provision in life. He is your provision for salvation. He is your provision for sanctification. He is your vision for galvanization. He is your provision for every need in life. All my needs according to his riches in glory. And Jesus said, that represents what I am. See, in the tabernacle, it was known as the bread of presence and the bread of provision. So God says, I'm always available. I always have provision available. God says, when you're sleeping, I'm making provision for you. So the table of showbread is the table of presence. Now I understand Psalm 23, 5. Thou preparest a table before me. This is the table David's talking about. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. When David said that, Saul was trying to kill him. David's enemies were after him. Saul and the house of Saul. It wasn't just Saul. It was all of Saul's house. And David said, I've come to the tabernacle. I'm starving. Do you have bread, Father? And God says, I have bread. I have provision for you, David. And I'm here. If you're here starving, and if you're in a bad situation, God said, I have bread and provision for you today. There's bread at the table. I can just imagine David going, oh, Lord, this ain't really right, but I'm starving. And God allowed it. Because God is provision. Jesus is our provision. That's what David's talking about. Thou preparest the table for me in the... He said, this table was available. And I went and God gave me provision. He saved me alive. He saved my life. Oh, well, that's a big deal because God had a plan for David to become the king of Israel. And God had a plan for David to be the father of somebody named Jesus Christ. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. And he will be the lion of the tribe of Judah where David was from. In fact, in Psalm 46, 1, David writes, God is our refuge and strength. A very present help. This is called the bread of, or table of presence. This is a table of presence. Do you know there's power in taking communion? This, this is provision and presence right here. Today when we celebrate this and honor the Lord in this, there is bread and provision here for you. The, the, God said, I, I want you to celebrate and honor this forever. I got one for you. You're going to do this in heaven with Jesus. I, I got, I got, and I got, you're going to do this in heaven with Jesus at the marriage supper of the Lamb. If you don't want to do it, you better learn how to do it here. I'm going to give you a chance here because you are going to do it in heaven with Jesus. I promise you. Read Revelation. <laughs> we could celebrate this in heaven. So Paul says this is the showing forth of the death of the Lord. Showing. S-H-E-W. So it's our job as believers to show forth the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is our job. 
Say, this is my job. To tell people, yes, Jesus died for my sin. And to tell them the truth, yes, he died for my sin. He was buried, but he rose again, hallelujah. And now he is ever living to make intercession for me. That's why I'm not as stupid as I used to be. That's why I'm not as clumsy as I used to be. That's why I don't make the mistakes I used to make. That's why God has now become my source and my provision. And God is now leading the way in the charge. And my intellect has now got the spiritual IQ. I have the IQ of God. Let this be, mind be in you that was in Christ. <laughs> I got smarter when I got saved. Amen. Amen. So Paul says this is showing. S-H-E-W. The translators got it right when they translated it out of Aramaic and Greek. That Paul was saying, let us show forth the table of showbread, who is Christ himself. This is the bread and the wine. Or the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God said, I have had this worship service. And I'm going to tell you right now, it's a worship service. Ever since Abraham. And God says, you get to, you get to participate in it. You get to participate in today. There's provision here. There's blessing here. There's goodness here. So communion is just showing forth the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that showing forth is us telling the world... That Jesus Christ came to die for us. And that God so loved us that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we are charged by Paul. Are you telling anybody about it? This is the table of showing forth who Jesus Christ is in our life. That, that, that's what the table represents. Well, I'm just going to go up and get my cracker and my juice and I'm good to go. God is saying, and when you're going, tell somebody about me. Please, please tell somebody about my death, burial, and resurrection. Please tell somebody. Show forth the praises of God, the Bible says. Yes, amen. The table of show forth. The table of show bread, which in Hebrew, S-H-E-W means show forth. So today as we take communion, I'm going to challenge you to commit to showing forth who God is in your life. The commitment to tell people about the goodness of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, to show forth who Christ is. That he has removed all your charges. The devil had a list of charges against you, brothers and sisters. But the blood of Jesus Christ has removed them. Hallelujah. And now we're like little children running in the woods, running in the forest. Praise God, we're free. We're free indeed. My charges have been removed. I'm not guilty anymore. You know, wonderful it's to live a guilt-free life with no shame. See, I read somewhere one time that, see, God wants to get us back to that, no shame. Adam and Eve were in the garden and they were naked and yet they were not afraid and they were unashamed. Because they were in perfection, walking with God. That's what, that's what the, this is all about. Showing forth what God has done for you. Father, I pray and ask that you just anoint this word today, this Resurrection Sunday. God, I thank you for the work of the cross. The cross itself represents the table of showbread. Made of wood, covered with the glory of God. Emmanuel, God with us himself nailed to that tree. Let us as believers become excited about the showing forth process of what God has done. Yes, it's Resurrection Sunday and we're excited for what you've done for us. But you have challenged us to tell others. And that is our commitment before you today, Father. To tell others of the mighty and glorious deeds of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If you agree, say amen. amen. So we're here to celebrate communion. Hun, would you go take the, get the elements ready? Take the, I, I, I get out of the camera. So as we take communion today, my challenge you today is, this cost God his son. And that's worth you telling people about. That's worth you showing forth who God is and what he's done for you. I'm not going to ask how long the last time it is that you witnessed to somebody. But I'm telling you, America needs the church to start telling them about Jesus Christ like we never have before. Your neighbors need to hear it. 
Your county officials need to hear it. Your school board needs to hear it. I'm telling you, people need to hear the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like we've never seen before in this country, it's time. So this is a worship service, so we're going to worship the Lord in this process. And we're going to kind of have a little bit different. It's, it, I'm not going to have a free-for-all because we have guests up here. And generally, we just have everybody come up when they feel led. But today, we're just going to go row by row. And Randy will come up, and uh, Randy's going to direct it. And just wait in your row till Randy comes and gets you. Then we're just going to go in circles like that, and you come back. As you take the elements, when you're done, you can put your cups in here. And this, is, this, this altar is available. If you need to spend some... But I want you to commit today to showing forth. That's what that table is. The sh table of show bread. Showing forth what it means and who it is. We're just going to start worshiping the Lord. And then Randy, if you'll just start having people come. Father, we ask you bless this time right now. Impassion our hearts this Resurrection Sunday. To come back to the old, the old Christian way of life. Of sharing Jesus Christ to anyone and everyone we can. Not running home, jumping on our computers. Telling our neighbors, telling our friends, telling our loved ones. You must be born again. You must be born again. I'm asking for that commitment today as you take this communion today. God started this in Genesis 14 on the earth. It was started in heaven before that because the Bible says the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. So it was started in heaven. But it was enacted on earth in Genesis 14 with Melchizedek and Abraham. God said this is a good thing. There's provision here. There's blessing here. There's grace here. There's mercy here. You ready? Let's celebrate what God has done for us. And God commanded Moses, you tell Aaron, this is my heart. This is my heart to my children. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God said, tell them, put my name on their children, for I'm in covenant with them. If they put my name on their children, I will seek them, for I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you agree, say amen. amen. If you need prayer, don't leave here. Prayer of any kind. Come up front. We'll pray for you. Otherwise, happy Resurrection Day to you. God bless you. Jesus lives. God bless you. You're dismissed. Hello, one and all. We have been receiving questions regarding where to send tithes and offerings. If you'd like to mail it in, you can do so at P.O. Box 2223, Sholo, Arizona, 85902. And please, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, share, and subscribe. While you're at it, like us on Facebook, link is in the description, and follow us on Instagram and Twitter, link is also in the description. Helps out us, helps out the channel, and most importantly, shows that this is a format you wish to see continue. And with that, we wish you a blessed week.